being here. Fantastic, thank you. All right, and in the um, in the chat right now is a link to the activity sheet, and I will, um, in just a minute, I will try to share that out so that everybody can see it. And we can, um, we're not going to start off with that necessarily, but I do want to sort of get us all on the same page of the theme for today. When we talk about student-centered learning, let me do that right now. Chrome tab. And I'm going to try to get better at adjusting my window so that you all can see the um, page wide enough. There you go. And now I will, I'm going to disconnect my video here as well. Okay, it's still not quite there. I'll just make it fit. Okay, so welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. Today's topic, we're going to, or theme, I guess, um, we, I like to call them themes now rather than topics, are is student-centered remote learning. So what can we do as instructors to help meet student needs? We've all recognized at this point that um, it's much different for students than it is face-to-face -face remote learning is much different for students than face-to-face -face learning, just as it is for us, right? And our needs are, are, are gone. And we've probably all witnessed some of our uh, more talkative face-to-face -face students might have disconnected or disappeared, or maybe the face-to-face -face or, or more connected students are really taking over the discussions and the people that were quiet are now absolutely gone. So what are the things that they're facing? What are some of the um, needs that they have? What are the things that we can do as instructors to sort of structure our courses so that they can't just disappear, so that they still have opportunities to connect with each other, to do pair share, um, and some of the other tricks that we would do in our in our face-to-face -face classrooms. For today's session, um, we're going to start off by breaking people out into groups and have us think about some of the questions that you might have. And how many people do we have? We have 31 participants, so six-ish. We got five participants, five moderators. Let's do six per group, and that way every moderator could be in with one of the participants. And if I see anybody still jump in, um, I'll jump out and and welcome them. So we'll start off with a small discussion for about oh seven, ten minutes, ten minutes. Now nah, seven minutes. We'll do it in seven minutes. Think about some of the questions you have and talk amongst yourselves. And the moderator or the moderators will help you um, come up with some some takeaways there. And then we can have a big discussion and hear from you directly um, from the different groups. Okay? JT or Karen, can you drop us into groups? Okay, so we just have to put ourselves in the groups that you would like. So I'll, I'll take group, group five. All right. okay. You putting yourself in? You want me to? Okay, all right, great. Oh, where did I go? All right, all right. So put your Margaret. Which group do you want? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Whatever's available. Okay, so I'll one. take group three. You'll take group three. I'm gonna put you in two then. Okay. Right. Let's try yourself in. Two. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll go into group one then. Let me update. Oops. 
wouldn't let me update you. Can you drag yourself in there, Margaret? Yeah, I'll drag myself in there. For some gotcha. reason, when I hit update, it wouldn't let me do it. That's odd. Hmm.
bring people back. And we're returning to the main room. All right, so here we are back in the main room, and I'm going to um, share out with the group again the link to the activity sheet for the people who joined us while we are in um, smaller groups. And in the smaller groups, we were talking about um, several of the different um, ideas that are the challenges that we've had. Oh, thank you for adding that activity sheet there. And I'm making it shared right now so that we can all see it on the screen as well. All right. And welcome back. So are there, what were some of the big things that we that we took away from um, in the discussion? Are there any um, ideas that you had um, that you saw in your group that you'd like to share out? Yeah, Tracy, go ahead. One thing that really stood out, um, well, variety of things did, let's face it. Um, the idea that we're always so reliant <clears throat> in our traditional classroom form of being in person of the um, the implicit communication, the things that we get from their faces, from their body language, and we're not gonna get that, obviously, in this format, and even if it is a synchronous um, lecture, um, but that we really need to encourage our students to be explicit in their communication. And in our group, we talked about different ways to do that. Um, we were talking about different polls, like just like check-ins, like, hey, are you getting the content? Is it muddy or is it is it clear? And just generally, how are you feeling? Um, so that was interesting. And I think especially I'm working with a lot of new students um, to the institution. So encouraging them to communicate, I think, is going to be one of those things that we're really going to have to work on a massage and encourage and not just point driven, in my opinion. So you said you said polls and, and how do you do the polls? Are you um, are you doing it as a canvas survey? Are you doing it uh, with poll everywhere or some other um, tool? Um, someone in our group was talking about that they use the poll through BBC Collaborate. Yeah, OK. Um, and so, obviously, you could use poll everywhere and things like that. But just some check-ins where it does, it's not a lot of commitment on the student side, but it also is a form of engagement for them. And it yeah. lets us know where they're at and how we need to shift things to improve it's their a, experience. Great. It's both a call for action, call to action for the students. So to sort of see, are they paying attention? Are they are they engaged right now? But it's also a formative feedback for the instructor to say, hey, these people are or are not engaged. And it's it's hard. It's hard to do that. Um, certainly hard to do that without having some sort of a, hey, are you all still there? Give me a thumbs up. Give me a, you know, raise your hand if you're still around. Something like that. Um, yep. Good, good. All right. And join. I think we fixed the problem there. And Lane, you have your hand up. Go ahead and join. Uh, unmute yourself yeah. and tell us Thank what you, you. Um, Yeah, I, just to touch off Tracy, that was that was our group. We were talking about that. And, and especially with like Blackboard, where you aren't able to really prep those questions beforehand. Um, yeah. I would, I what I've done in the past is I put them on a Google slide or just a, slide, a presentation PowerPoint. I'll have them prepped all ready to go, but they'll be key to like how or Blackboard, you know, does one, two, three, four, I'll have them like, are you, is this clear? Yes, you know, one, no is four, and then something in between, you know, two and three. So that way you can do it really quickly without having to really interrupt the lecture. You can say, hey, let's have a check-in, and then you just pop open the slide and turn on a poll. You don't have to type up stuff manually, which kind of can be convoluted. So that was just kind of a helpful thing. Just you share the screen with the poll question, and then they, they take the poll at the bottom of the screen in Blackboard. Excellent. That's yeah. That's a, that's a great tip for quickly doing using the pull feature in Blackboard Collaborate. Um, did any other groups talk about learner interactions or some of these multiple options for them? Or Our feedback, getting feedback from each other. 
Who, uh, I'm sorry, what was the name of the person who was talking about her discussion forums? Would you, do you want to quickly share? Because you had a really good example and concern about when your course gets larger, providing feedback. And I'm sorry, I forgot to write down your name. <laughs> uh, who was talking about that in our group? Okay, good. Was it Lynn? Uh, Go ahead, Lynn. Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, this sorry. is Lynn. Is that, um, I think this is who you were asking. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so we had done um, uh, uh, discussion boards um, using um, a method which had each person had to post a reading response and then post two responses to other people's posts at a minimum. Um, and I used uh, Morty Gernsbacher's um, uh, criteria for that. So you had to do two of four um, uh, responses forms of response, like a compliment, a challenge, a question, and I can't remember what the other one was, something that moves the discussion forward. Yeah. Um, and so that was really successful on the students' part. I felt like their discussion points were really good, but um, it, it proved a lot of work for me to keep up with that. So this was an async, a, a small class uh, with um, 10, 10 active students of whom um, three actually were grad students and they, they did a really good job, but I wasn't good at, um, restraining myself on my sense of like that I needed to be, um, commenting a lot. And so that it, it seemed like a lot more work to me for me. All right. But Does anyone... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah oh, right, right. At what cost, right, to yourself? Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that's great. And I'm trying to find a, a link to that um, Canvas discussion or discussion, effective discussions. Maybe. Right, I know I got it off of one of these, from one of these right. workshops. It looks um, like, I, I bet we're going to, yeah, we're not, we, we don't have it in this one, but I'm. Um, John, I know we're going to get it. I know great. That'd be great if you can grab that and, and put right. it under the resources on the bottom. That'll be good. Under the resources, there's also an, another link to um, the Design, Teach, Engage course. And I'm sorry for scrolling up and down for everybody, but um, and that's. Um, I was asked about right discussion here. rubrics, and I know that's in one of our. And so I suggested some rubrics as well, and the template that we have. Well, now we have two templates. One for summer and one the original one and both of them have a rubric in there a very simple one for for uh, initial post and response post i don't yeah. know jt if you can find that easily too otherwise i'll try to search for it it's on one of the one of the documents um so that's another easy thing to do because canvas has a very nice rubric tool that works really well with discussion forums and uh I created one and put it in the, the KB so people would have access because I couldn't find any good one about original post and response posts. So there's one in in the um, template documents if, uh, that we can share. So if I can find that link, I'll put it in here and um, as well. Wonderful. Um, who has some idea on uh, to, to answer the question of how do we do this in a way that doesn't take up all of our own time um, are there ways that we can put some of that agency and ownership onto the students um, so that, one, we ask them to become more engaged, and two, ask them to be a little bit more um, responsible for maintaining or making connections, making and maintaining connections with each other um, and with, I guess, the, the course and course material. Does anyone have any ideas on that? Well, I have another extremely um, labor intensive way and that <laughs> we'll start with that. That's great in my to have my students. Um, like two or three times a semester. Um, do sort of peer reviews of other people if they're if they're in groups do peer reviews of other people's um, contributions to the groups. Um, uh -huh. But I don't have, I'm not going to splurge to pay for the software that will automatically sort those out. So then either I or the TA have to then match up all of the uh, response, the appropriate responses with the right person who's supposed to get those responses. Uh, but right. when I've done that, the students 
have often said that was one of the most valuable, useful things they had of the whole semester because it just they learned so much and they thought it was so helpful to get that feedback and get it multiple times so that then they could improve in their discussions. So that's and that's that's it's a brilliant idea to they need feedback on that, right? And they need feedback in order to be effective um, practitioners, disciplinary practitioners. Um, they can um, in your field, whatever field that whatever field that you teach, you want them to to be able to give and receive feedback well. You want them to be able to um, the the four elements of the Wisconsin experience. You want them to to have some empathy and humility. You want them to be intellectually confident to give feedback to each other. You want them to be curious about what they can do to be a little bit more effective. This these things are going to be helpful in regardless of what field you're in, but also in your class. So oftentimes we think of this as um, a sort of the soft skills, but they're actually integral to, to whatever we teach. We just often forget about them because we're so focused on the, the, the hard content, if you will. And yeah, uh, in the chat, they talk about uh, Canvas has a peer editing features that could help you with that as well. Lane, go ahead. Sorry, I had to turn on the mic. Uh, Sarah, thank you for sharing that. Could you just kind of briefly um, kind of describe once more what you're, you're using uh, for discussions? Students were peer reviewing each other in discussions. Just kind of explain a little bit more how that, that worked. Okay, so this was in person, so I didn't, I don't know about the Canvas peer editing features, so I'm going to have to look that up. Um, but um, throughout the semester, each um, group, uh, people, students stayed in the same group of about five people for the entire semester. Um, and then um, at least once a week, we would, um, during class, I prepared sort of these folders, whatever, where everybody had a problem, the same problem, every group had the same problem to solve. And they had to, as a group, figure out what was the best answer out of usually five options that I gave them. Um, and then after they were, then we come back together as a whole class to debate so they would, the groups would justify their answers and that kind of thing. So they were in these groups all semester long. And so usually like the second week of the semester and then around midterms and then at the end, um, I had them do a um, review, peer review and self-assessment um, for everybody in their group along. Some of, some were very, you know, just numerical. And then there was, there was um, person two that you would like to continue doing. And then the other was, what was the suggestion of, what would you most like somebody to change going forward in this discussion? Um, mm -hmm. And then I sorted them out and made sure everybody got theirs that, you know, anonymized what other people had told them, said about them. And then I also on the same sheet put their own self-assessment so they could compare what everybody said about them to what they said about themselves. Um, and they loved it. So I'm curious, did, did, they, did they grade themselves approximately the same as they graded each other? Did, was there, what did they learn from that? Uh, some people, you know, it was very interesting. Some people were pretty clear on how they were performing. Um, uh -huh. Well, you know, because the, the numerical things were, do you come prepared to class? You know, have you done the reading? You know, do you offer ideas? Do you react to other people's ideas? That kind of thing. Um, sometimes there was a huge disconnect. Often, um, it really worked for the students who were very shy and didn't like to talk because almost without fail, their peer, their group members would say, you know, gosh, when, when George says something, it's really great, George, I'd really like it if you would participate. I would, really would like it if you would share your ideas more often. Um, and so a lot of my students, this was in a Com B class, um, but a lot of the students were saying, you know, I was terrified to talk in public beforehand, even in a small group. Throughout the semester, I get used to talking in a small group. Um, and by the end of the semester, they were willing to stand up and defend their group's answer to the whole class. So, awesome. um, yeah, it was great. So they're learning that intellectual confidence there through that small group by being vulnerable amongst themselves in, in a sort of a smaller, more manageable, safer space. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. And Lynn, you had some experience with the um, 
peer review function as well. Um, and you are having them, you're making, can, can you talk about what you're doing here, what you said in chat? Yeah, that was kind of complicated. Um, so I had them, I had each person review one draft of a final paper. Normally, um, if I did it in class, I would have done two. Big, um, big points for doing the draft rather than the final version, because the draft, they will change, sure. but the final one, they won't even read the feedback. Good. Right, right. No, 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 no. They, they did it on a draft. And, um, and so I reduced it from two to one, partly because I made the final paper longer because I dropped a paper because of the um, changeover. Sure. Um, and so what I found in the system was I was I, I set it up so that I, I I did the peer reviews by hand because I mean I assigned them by hand because of the diversity of ability um, and writing ability in the class. And um, and I made it so that people weren't reviewing each other's the same pair of people wasn't reviewing each other's paper. It was like a sidestep thing. Yeah. Um, and then what and I also had um, an editing sheet, uh, which I gave to them, which they had to upload, which I couldn't figure out how to really turn it into a rubric. Okay. Um, I, because I'm it not sounds that like an editing sheet that was similar to a rubric. It's, it's kind of similar to a rubric. It asks them questions and it says, did they do this and did they do that? And um, but it is a free form answer. So they had to do two kinds of responses. They did they had to um, edit on the page for copy editing and, uh, you know, asterisking the thesis of the, the thesis claim. Uh -huh. And um, and then they had to fill out the editing sheet and the editing sheet because it was more free form. You know, it's like, does this person have evidence? Um, be based on your reading. Is this, you know, do you see any any mistakes in like obvious things like dates or you know stuff uh -huh. like that? Does the argument flow? Okay, so all that kind of stuff. But um, so they had to upload those. Um, one or two people had difficulty learning how to do that. Um, they, what I found was that then I downloaded everything and then I had to rename I could have made them do a naming uh, a naming convention that would have helped if I had done that um, so that they all of their papers were named in a particular way that would have perhaps helped but but then I had to connect if I would since I was trying to grade the person both on their their paper and also separately on their review of somebody else's paper those two things, appear in Canvas in two different places because the reviews appear with the um, with the reviewed person's paper. Right. So it's kind of messy for resorting. And I I and, and that would have been a reason maybe to do a rubric version, which I think might have worked better. But I couldn't awesome. figure out how to how to manage that. And so I just manually did it, which was fine because there weren't that many students in the course. But I couldn't imagine asking a TA to do that. Right, and it also it, it this is a this sounds like it's a a, a high effort on your part um, thing. Although it's it's oh, great. it was and, silly, <laughs> but it really works for them. Great. Their papers were better. Their sense of like oh somebody could make a completely different argument based on the same evidence, um, and that was part of the pedagogical point too. You know, Excellent. is that. There are a lot of threads through history, and you guys have just had a whole course in this stuff, and you're each making your own path through the material. And for them to see another person's path, I mean, some of them said, I would never have thought of looking at it this way. And yeah. that was really important to me that they get that. Well, and yeah, they, they learn from each other that way just by, by looking at each other's. And oftentimes we think of learning, or we, you know, traditionally it was one student just kind of presenting something to the instructor. But the more that we're able to say, hey, look at my work before I give it to the instructor or guided by an editing sheet, the, the better. Good. JT. Sort of piggybacking off that, Lynn, thanks for those, um, that, that entire process. Very, I can, I can appreciate the, the amount of effort and work that you put into that. And I was wondering um, from the conversation that we had in my group, um, if, um, Megan, if you're still on the line, um, if, 
if it seems that Canvas peer reviewing or sort of these online discussion forums would work in a clinical setting, um, or if they would maybe facilitate some of those um, interactions that you described as being potentially problematic for losing that person-to-person um, -person coordination. I don't know if you, I hate to call you out directly, but. Well, I mean, while we have been using them, <laughs> um, I mean, not necessarily um, for some of the clinical, um, but things that are dovetailing from the clinical, such as journal um, clubs or, or you know, some of our, I mean, I've, I've moved a lot of my um, teaching um, and that sort of thing. Um, we do mostly, um, you know, the we do secured, like HIPAA secured WebEx for, um, specifically for um, pathology cases that we share um, mm -hmm. uh, that way, but but um, but there are some um, aspects, especially the, I haven't specifically used the peer review, although um, that that might be a really good way to incorporate some of this um, in into kind of figuring out how to like clinical skills, for example, stuff like that um, that do need feedback and and um, over time might be a really nice way to do that. Um, yeah, but with, with the, the concept that there's HIPAA stuff that also adds mm. <laughs> complications as well, um, so we can only use certain platforms. Yeah, because I was thinking of when Sarah mentioned the, um, the use of um, everyone has the same case and they're presenting a case by the end of um, you know, the semester, there's sort of that understanding. It just made me think of that conversation, but thanks for sharing that. And Megan, you, you mentioned a, a journal club, so it's not just a, the journal, it's not just self-reflection, which is really cool, but tell me about the club element of that. Uh, so, I mean, basically, there, there are different ways that um, that are it's actually implemented, um, depending on the level of, of the student, really, but um, um, I'll give you just a, a specific example. I had um, a couple of medical students that were rotating um, in um, microbiology, virology, um, and they um, had different interests. One was going into pediatrics and one was going into um, internal medicine. So I um, chose articles um, in virology that were that could be relevant to their um, what they would do in, in a residency and then they I give them a format of, um, of how to critically evaluate a, um, a manuscript or um, and then they they come back and we discuss it um, and and kind of go through um, how, how do you assess a, a paper etc what what are what's good bad about it and the club part of it is that um, sort of everybody, Participates even if you didn't read the full art or that if even if you're not formally presenting that article right. um, And figure out how you know, and so everybody learns from the other person in that in that way um, And usually there are specific um, to, we, we just rotate topics basically Okay, but in some ways this is great because you're giving students a chance to what some agency um, Ownership of the class they have to actually teach that section of it um, mm -hmm. or do something where other people learn from it. And, um, and yeah, that idea of, of learning from each other, that also helps with the, like, everybody's going to make some mistakes and mm -hmm. other people, you know, they all recognize that, oh, well, I'm gonna make mistakes too, so I'm gonna be gentle when this person makes mistakes. It's all part of being human. Um, and that's another great way to um, build yeah, up that, that sense I of community. It also add, it it definitely I found doing it virtually was was a little bit different and and um and interesting because they felt a little bit more sometimes when you do it in in person um you know <laughs> can be uh I don't know I, I felt like they took a lot of agency in that um but also um you know in in presenting it to their peers but like you say realizing that um that sometimes the journal itself the article itself has flaws and getting then figuring out that part especially depending on the level of the of the trainee um, that's a that that concept is is really important and, and kind of fun to have them figure out you know that sometimes you send them a bad article just <laughs> to see you know just so we can discuss it <laughs> that's awesome yeah I, I and, and I remember early on my first second year in graduate school I had no idea um, how to read academic articles because I had been a literature major earlier. So I was reading them as a narrative, but it took, like I had to talk with other other students in order to figure out 
oh wait, this is totally different. Mm -hmm. And I can pick that up from each other with from others. So yeah, great. Great ideas. Um who else has some ideas for in class collaborations or having students teach um, and learn from each other? Any other ideas that people have on, on this? Have Has anybody figured out? Oh, yes, Gloria, Piazza. So I'm really curious about Piazza because I know that in, in a face-to-face -face classroom, it's a powerful tool. But I'm wondering, in the online-only classroom, is it even more powerful because it allows for some of those peer-to-peer um, -peer interactions? Um, and this idea of uh, students open to sharing solutions and helping each other students. Gloria, I wonder if you'd be able to, if you'd share, do they, did you notice, were they presenting themselves anonymously or did they share each other with their names? I know Piazza lets you ask sort of the dumb questions anonymously, which gives you the confidence to be able to ask the dumb question without sort of outing yourself that, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, or did they, did they talk and say, hey, I'm, I'm John, I know the answer to this, or John, the, this question that might, maybe it's a dumb question. Insight yeah, on, on, on what you noticed with that? Yeah, usually they prefer to present as anonymous because yep. uh, especially in this, in this um, area, it's a stats, uh, they are a little shy uh, that the response is wrong. So because of that, yeah. they prefer uh, to show like anonymous. But once they realize uh, the answer is good, so they are really open to share and help others. I really love this, uh, this, this Piazza because I, for many students, because the lecture was really big, so more than a hundred students. So for them uh, to have the opportunity to share with others and have the endorsement of the TAs of me, that was something that they really appreciate. So I think that was a really good, good tool. So once you endorsed a, an answer um, from an uh, anonymous person, did they say, oh, that was me? And add yes. the name to it, you know, so that they'd be proud of it? Yes, Excellent. not not in lecture, but especially when they were <laughs> out of lecture, they were really open to share, oh, that was me. And, and then we encouraged more uh, then. And, they were, uh, the, the other thing that I love was the way we were able to, I mean, try to, to practice like humility with others. I mean, with the person who maybe uh, take the courage to share uh, one solution, but the solution was not the, the one, what was not the correct. So that was a really good experience, how to handle these things. I mean, don't discourage the student in front of the others but instead try to correct, try to guide them to the right a, a solution. That was another important experience using this. Excellent. Yeah. And Gloria, have you been using Piazza for a long time or, or what was your initial experience in learning about Piazza and trying it out? Was it, was it difficult to put it into play? Well, no, it was not difficult. So. So for me, that all this has been a really great experience because I just uh, joined the UW Madison this semester, and in this semester was everything. I need to move my big lecture to online, fully online, in a rush. So the experience was <laughs> rush. So uh, I took the experience right. from another colleague. Uh, uh, he was a person with a big experience, and he recommended me to use Piazza. Uh, because of his uh, experience, I decided to use that. Uh, at the beginning, I tried to use in the lecture, so for the first two months, but then when I right. need to move to online, I decided to continue with Piazza. And honestly, I think the experience was really good. Even I don't know experience using Piazza. So taking this uh, recommendation of my colleague was really, really, really nice because uh, I was able to implement this during the online. A version also 
that was good. I really recommend that, especially, I don't know, uh, I'm teaching a quantitative um, uh, uh, course, but I think that is helpful for whatever application is, yeah. I know it's very popular in some of the quantitative courses and some of the STEM courses um, where, um, where there is a one right answer and then people can kind of work together to come up with the right answer to that uh, very sticky question or that very wicked question um, that some people use it that way. So it's, 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 it's I love to hear people from uh, qualitative courses talk about how they use it as well, just for that student connected connection. Um, yeah, great. We have about five minutes left, and I want to make sure that we, if there's a question that you want to talk about, raise your hand and let's talk about it because um, this is a good opportunity to get feedback from you know 26 other people on that. So if you have something or if you have a challenge, if you have something that worked really well, um, Tracy, go ahead. Yeah, hold on. Oh, gosh. Ah! Oh, no. We hear you. You're great. Oh, it is. It's working. <laughs> yes. Sorry. OK. Um, I'd like to know, um, on our student resources um, for COVID-19, it talks a lot about um, remote learning. And it, a lot of the stuff that was created, which is Okay, sorry. I'm sharing the office with my husband. He's debating. I just have two minutes to ask a question, Jeff. Um, all of the stuff that was created is relating to making the transition from brick and mortar to online. Is there anything you created for starting online for students? Well, Karen Skiba, do you want to talk about that? Is Karen still there? Yes, I, I will jump in and say yes. At the very bottom of our, our sheet, we have resources. And there is a Design, Teach, Engage website that. Um, yep, we'll sorry add. about that. What was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> the question is, are there are there upper, are a lot of the, the um, how do you design a course from scratch um, for online, not moving to remote instruction, but for online? And I was going to point them to the Design Teach Engage. JT just put it in the in the lab notes. Um, that's a great way to sort of it's a great set of resources that you can look through on your own that were designed, I think, specifically for creating an online course from scratch. Is that correct, Karen? Yeah, that is. And we also have a program called Teach Online, and the first course is taking place right now. And there'll be a facilitation course coming up in July. But I want to give a shout out to Karen's course. Do you want to quickly mention that, Karen, because that one is more immediate? I saw so. Karen just left, but there is oh, an opportunity. There, okay. there is another program called um, Preparing, Preparing to Teach Online, online. Mm -hmm. and it will be, uh, Karen describes it as a boot camp, so it's just a five-day course on, on doing this. Um, Karen Skibba's Teach Online at UW is a much lar larger um, um, but much more in-depth uh, way to, to do this. Right, um, so if you want to do it quickly, then the uh, Preparing to Teach Online will be good, and that's coming up soon. And if you want more details uh, that's more in-depth, then we got Teach Online at UW and as well. And Lauren Rosen brings up a really beautiful point. What about preparing the students? And today's session is on remote, you know, instruction for 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 student-centered remote instruction, it's very important, um, I think, <laughs> that that we have to build that in. Um, and I don't know how many or if there are any opportunities outside of us individually working in our courses to say, hey, we recognize that this course is going to be online, so what can we do to make it online? What can we do to prepare you for that? Um, and those are the things, um, our tips for the remote environment, over communication, scaffolding the workflow, maintaining consistency, providing multiple interactions, multiple options. We know that some students love to just jump in and start talking. Other people need to think for a while and, and type. So having synchronous and asynchronous options for students to be able to connect and, and to engage, different ways for them to show off the skills that they have. Um, so if some people are great at videos, that's great. If some people are really good at creating playlists, 
you know, they can curate things well. Give them that option. Ask them. Um, getting feedback, um, smaller chunks, those are all good. Um, and Tracy added, yep, the learning remotely from the COVID-19 uh, COVID site that the campus has. Sarah Tall also talks about the, the module zero. Module zero, if you're not familiar with it, is before you start with a course content, module zero says, hey students, here's how you can be successful in the course. Here are the expectations. Here are um, tips that you will um, find can be uh, successful for you. One of my favorite modules, uh, module zeros, has videos from past students saying, hey, I struggled with this element of the course. Here's how I overcame that. And having the students watch people who look and sound like them rather than the instructor, um, that's much more powerful than if the instructor says that as well. So any times you can get students that you've had in your course to come back in and share with the students quotes or videos or whatever, that's powerful stuff. All right, what other information do we have? It's I posted the information on the upcoming professional development opportunities that would be if they wanted Great. to find out any of those. And Lauren Rosen, you're going to come back and share an infographic tip sheets that people can put in their module zero. That's awesome um, in a month or two. Okay, well, for fall. We'll do it for fall if we're still online in fall. And even here's the thing. Any time that you can use backwards design to really think about your course and what are the important parts of your course and how do I get the evidence to show that that has been accomplished and what are the activities, step three, that that I can have to produce those options that or those those that evidence, that will help you whether you're teaching an online course or a face-to-face -face course. People who have taken those professional development things even for the face-to-face, -face, they have found a much easier transition to the online space because it helps them be a little bit more organized and more prepared. Any last moments? I'm going to stick around for the next um, 10 to 15 minutes to answer questions in chat. I want to be respectful of your time here. Um, it is now 2.01, so thank you for coming. We are going to have more of these every Wednesday until June 8th, 17th. And um, the topics I think are useful. Come share your thoughts and experiences. And thank you for coming today. Take care.